we can go ahead and start. Good evening, everyone. Today is October 12th, 2021. And I want to welcome you guys all to our governance meeting that is taking place today. And I would like to go ahead and start uh, calling to order this governance workshop of the Azusa Unified School District to order. We're going to go ahead and get started with um, our flag salute 1.2. Do we have Hunter C. from Slauson? I'm here. Yeah. Hi, Hunter. How are you doing? I'm good. How are you? Great, great. Long time no see. <laughs> Yesterday we saw you at Chick fil A. Uh, yeah. Right, right. Um, thank you for coming out and supporting your schools. Uh, yesterday, um, we got to see a lot of the students at the fundraiser with the Azusa and Gladstone fundraiser um, uh, kickoff that we had yesterday. We'll go ahead and get started when when you are, Hunter. Or you're going to lead us in the flag salute. All right. Please stand for the flag salute. Put your right hand over your heart. Ready? Begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. You may be seated. Thank you so much for leading us in the flag salute today. And uh, did you guys enjoy your Chick-fil-A at home? Yeah, it was good. Awesome. Awesome to hear. Well, tell your mom thank you so much for allowing you to join us today and, and with our flag salute for our governance workshop today on October 12th, 2021. And I will let you go because you probably have homework or things to attend. And so thanks again and say hello to your parents from us. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. We'll go ahead and move on to 1.3. We have a roll call. We'll start with board member Cruz Gonzalez. Present. Board member Greer. Board member Bo? Here. Board member Rodriguez Pena? Present. And board member Arianes, myself, I am here. There's five of us. Thank you. We'll go ahead and move on to 2.1, approval of agenda. Can I please get a motion to move 2.1? Make Someone. a motion to approve 2.1. Second. Great. We have a first motion by board member Rodriguez Pena, and we have a second by board member Greer. If we can go ahead and do a roll call vote, since um, we will go ahead and start with board member Cruz Gonzalez. Yes. Board member Greer. Yes. Board member Bo. Yes. And board member Rodriguez Pena. Yes. And I myself, board member Arianes. Yes, it passes 5 0. And I want to go ahead and let the public know we, we we welcome your public comments on agenda or non-agenda items, which moves us to our agenda item 3.1. Do we have anyone in the audience that would like to go ahead and um, leave a comment at this time? I'm sorry, what was that? I apologize. Uh, we do not have anybody online. Great. Thank you, Lika, for checking on that. And we'll go ahead and move on to our general functions. And today, we, we, we have um, in our board governance workshop, we have parliamentary process 4.1. And I'll go ahead and turn the time over. We have our legal counsel, Mr. Carlos here today to, to go ahead and lead us with, with, this, um, with this item. Thank you, Madam Board President. I'm gonna move this a little closer. Okay, if I take my mask off while I'm presenting. I think it'll make everything a little bit more clear, and I tend to be a low talker, but if the room fills up and everybody runs in to hear more about Robert Nichols, then I'll probably mask. And sure. A couple of things. Uh, I think you need to be closer to the mic, and if I'm not mistaken, I think our protocol indoors for education has to have a mask. I appreciate that. Recalibration there, Superintendent Ortega. Well, he's putting on his mic. I, I do want to remind... Um, our cabinet and our, our board that um, it's very important we speak into the mic as uh, 
I went back and saw um, our board meeting, uh, this last board meeting. There was a few times where I, I could not hear some of your comments. Um, so we can kindly just speak into the mic so that way we are we are recorded. Um, and I also tend to be a low talker. So I'm going to make sure that I kind of speak right directly into the mic. And I'm going to pull up my PowerPoint presentation here so that we can all follow along. And I think at this point, that means I'm going to have to share. Okay, here we are. Well, thank you everybody for giving me some time to kind of lead us in a governance training here focused on Robert's World of Order. And when we first scheduled the training, I don't think we anticipated that the Dodgers were going to be playing the Giants in the playoffs tonight. That was not intentional. Okay. We didn't do that to clear the room. Um, because usually Robert's Rules is a big draw. And so everybody comes <laughs> piling in for it. Actually, it was one of the, the first things that I ever did as an attorney was kind of lead a, a big uh, BAC meeting and a bunch of angry parents through a Robert's Rules of Order presentation. And so it was kind of riveting, um, but it also gave me some direction about how important Robert's Rules of Order can be for governing bodies moving forward. So just a little bit of background about Robert's Rules of Order and what we're going to be doing today and really what the purpose is. My big picture look at Robert's Rules of Order is that it allows you to have a meeting and to get through all the different process and make sure that everybody is heard in a meeting and kind of make sure you stay away from certain stumbling blocks that can happen with meetings. And I've, as a matter of fact, I'm, I'm on a board. I've sat on nonprofits as well. When you don't have a process, sometimes things can feel a little bit like a food fight and they can take two or three hours. And so really Robert's Rules of Order are there to kind of give us a clear process on how to proceed. Now, one thing I do want to focus on here is the interplay between Robert's Rules of Order and the Brown Act, right? And so, and I think this is probably a good thing to lead with here. I've looked at your board policies. I've looked at your board bylaws. In no place have I seen that the board has formally adopted Robert's Rules of Order. But there was an exhibit that I believe now CSBA is no longer adopting, and I, I believe the district will, won't be having that exhibit in, anymore, even though it is technically on the website right now. There is an exhibit that shows some parliamentary, some parliamentary procedure, some parts of Robert's Rules. So what that tells me, and just in looking at the practice of the board, is Robert's Rules is, is established here, it's used, and it should be a tool. So when we're thinking, you know, and we're up all weekend and we're kind of worrying about what happened in the board reading, I'll tell you, as legal counsel, the number one thing you want to be worried about is the Brown Act, right? So the Brown Act is really there to make sure that all of the actions of the school district are happening in public. And the Robert, Robert's Rules will be there as a tool to get us through these different meetings. And I wanna make sure that as we go along, we're not conflating the two. And I have some hypotheticals for you at the end that will really help you see where it's not always clear where Robert's Rules stop and where the Brown Act begins. And we can jump into a little bit of background. I'm not gonna kind of belabor this, but ultimately it was created by Henry Robert. And the idea was to give local legislative bodies the ability to use congressional procedures. And so I'm, we're not gonna make it a four hour presentation, but ultimately it's, it's the idea that if you don't have a compass, if you don't know how to have the process, um, it can be problematic. And I've seen some, some of the meetings and I think um, the board really has tried, I think to adhere to Robert's rules across the board and just in how you're conducting business. So I wanna, I wanna emphasize that today. Ultimately, the right of the majority to make those decisions. And I've seen most of your votes tend to be 4-1 or unanimous. So the idea is that even in a 4-1 vote or in a 3-2 vote, the minority has that opportunity to be heard. In fact, that's kind of like a basic tenet of democracy, that the minority can be heard. But it doesn't mean that the minority can stop the meeting in its track. There has to be a process where they're heard and then you can still conduct the business of the district. Now, again, rights of individual board members to participate. This isn't something I've seen um, in my observation of the meetings I've been present. I haven't seen any problems with that necessarily, but I do think the way that board members participate 
is critical, right? It has to be in a in, in a productive way, in a way that they're heard, and then the, the districts, the majority of the board's majority can still proceed. Now, ultimately, the board does have the right to create more rules and regulations, but as I mentioned to you, there's nothing in there that I see that really speaks to Robert's rules being adopted. It's more of an informal practice here in the district. All right, now, what I would normally do in a situation like this is I would walk around the room and I would try to get feedback from each one of you, but I'll stay here at, at the podium. And I wanna encourage you though, if you want to interrupt me and ask a question, don't feel the need to wait. Go ahead and throw it at me. And, that, and that's kind of what I'm expecting here tonight. But also, ultimately, the Brown Act is really about making sure that all the board's actions are transparent. And beyond just being transparent, that the public had notice of what was going to be on the agenda and they had an opportunity to come and participate in that process. So a lot of times, things that you can do under Robert's rules, you may not be able to do under the Brown Act because of the, the strict adherence to agendizing matter. We talked a little bit about Robert's rules and the need for order and the efficiency. And ultimately, again, I'm gonna hammer this point. The Brown Act is the law, Robert's rules is a procedural guide. And I do think that a certain amount of formality can help you through meetings. Um, they can help make sure that the minorities voice voices are heard. And it also helps the board to portray itself um, in the best way possible to the public. Because I think ultimately that's what the public wants to see. When they log in, they wanna be able to see the board, adhering to certain types of formality, and then the board taking care of its business. I think that's, that's ultimately as a constituent what you want to see out of your local governing board. Now, if there is a conflict, and we'll talk about this later in one of the hypotheticals, the Brown Act control. And again, the Brown Act is what's going to keep me up at night. Um, the Brown Act is the thing that we have to make sure that there's no, there's no problems or, or procedural problems with the Brown Act. And if there are, there are ways to cure those, but it's really not a space that you want to be in. So, and I want to go back one second. If there is a minor problem with the Robert's Rules of Order, that does not mean that there is a Brown Act violation. So I just want to hammer that just, just so that when everybody leaves, we know there can be a slight issue in terms of the motion. You know, was it a, was it a main motion? Was it a secondary motion? Was it a procedural motion? Um, does the system only allow for one vote? Do we have to do a hand recording of the next vote? All of those things can be worked out among the board. The big, the big spin, though, would be if there's a Brown Act violation, and then that becomes an issue, and it could potentially invalidate the entire act. All right, but Robert Schull's problems by themselves will not invalidate the board action. Okay, so I'm going to get into a few of these things, and keep in mind, the terminology I'm using is directly from Robert Schull's of order. So if, if I use a phrase and you don't recognize the phrase, do not despair. We can kind of unpack it and see if it, if it matters. What I wanted to do was pull as much of this terminology directly from Robert's rules and also from the old exhibit that the district had, just so that you can get a sense of what these things are. So, Carlos, please. I'll be the first to interrupt just to go back to your hammering of the point, <clears throat> just so that I'm processing it correctly. Um, we post the agenda 12 hours before the meeting. Brown Act violation, there's problems. Absolutely. And I would say no amount of Robert's rules is going to fix that. Correct. Uh, we're having a board meeting. Uh, somebody makes a motion to approve something. We forget to do a second and we go right into voting. The voting takes place. It passes five to zero. Later on, somebody says, ooh, no. That, that's not that's not okay. There, there was never a second. That's not equivalent to I posted the agenda 12 hours before the meeting. Nope. I'd say minor Robert's Rules issue, but all five board members clearly recorded their vote and the public had an opportunity to participate. I say we move forward. And, and I think, and I appreciate that, uh, Superintendent Ortega, I think he was making a point of order. So it's kind of fitting that you did that right now. Uh, but ultimately, a point of order would be to correct a breach in the rules. And in my mind, it's only used for major infractions. So it, it, this is not um, this is not the floor of the Senate. And so in, in all the meetings that I've seen, I've never seen any of the board members make a point of order. Um, I haven't seen that happen. But ultimately, let's say, for example, 
you had a main motion that was considering a contract. So, and, and I want to be as um, completely hypothetical as possible. Let's say you have a contract uh, with an outside vendor who's going to come clean the sidewalk in front of the school. And there is a motion on the floor. And then another board member says, well, I move to have a different contract that's going to clean the driveway. Completely different contract, different vendor. At that point, the second board member would be out of order. That would be an infraction because there's currently a motion before the board. And we're going to talk about this a little bit. But whoever has the responsibility of chairing the meeting, that person really needs to recognize the board member who wants to speak before that motion is even made. Um, and that's it's not a fun fun job to have at these types of meetings. I've chaired meetings, and it often um, it's like you're having dual hat. You have extra work when you're at the meetings. But a motion like that would be out of order. So we would say point of order. There's been an infraction. Please. So what happens if they do a substitute motion? Well, the point I was making is that we're doing a two main motion. And so a point of order saying there's been an infraction that's out of order at this point in time, that was the hypothetical I was trying to build. But if we have a substitute motion, and the way I've looked at it is motion to amend or supplant the original motion, that would make sense. It just would depend on the time. So I think normally our practice is to, if somebody doesn't like that, not, not just do point of order, but also like, like what we could do so that people understand what, what went wrong. That makes sense. And I think what I'm trying to do is give you some tools from Robert's Rules of Order. And, I, and again, this doesn't mean that at your next board meeting, there's going to be 20 points of order. The idea is that there's actually a parliamentary process where we can say that particular motion is out of order at this point in time. And so we need to take a pause and get back to the original main motion. Um, but as the board member suggested, there are other exceptions to the exception. And the Roberts Rule of Order is only about four or 500 pages, the one that I was reviewing. And so there's a lot of different things that you can do in the context of these board meetings that may make a particular motion acceptable for the moment. Please. So, for example, I, ha I have a question. Um, when we have a, a board action, right, and... Um, and one of the board members wants to split it up. How do how do we move forward with that? So that's a point of is that a point of order? That's an infraction. No, okay. I think I think that would be permitted. Okay. In my mind, how do we move forward? In in my mind, it, it would look something like this: there is a vendor who wants to come in, and the vendor is going to clean the sidewalks, and they are also going to clean the rooftop. At some point after the motion and after the second. There's a discussion about the cleaning of the sidewalks, the cleaning of the rooftop. And, um, and I hope you don't mind, board members. I'm going to start not picking on you, but using you instead of saying board member A. Dr. Bo points out, you know, the rooftop cleanup really is a different conversation than the sidewalk cleanup. So Dr. Bo makes a procedural motion to split the two motions. We're going to first vote on whether or not we're going to have the contract to do the sidewalks. And then after that, we can have a second motion that would entertain the cleaning of the rooftop. So that that is an acceptable procedural motion that is not an infraction or a violation of the rule. And I, I do think that as you start to get into really complicated areas that have multiple layers, you may find yourself in a position where you say, you know what, we don't want to tackle all of this, whatever this is. We don't want to tackle it, all of it in one motion. We do want to break those things out. That would be a procedural motion. So, so just closing on the point of order, I don't see this as something that you're going to be doing all the time, please. So just going back, before we come away from that, the idea of splitting the two, if, you know, so I know we have our computer systems that move us, that move us right along, and, 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 but, but just because our computer systems allow or don't allow for something, like you said, that's not necessarily a violation. But if we were to be in a situation like that where something was split into two, is it how 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 is it indicated that we're? Is it because it's 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 indicated prior to that we're st even though we've made a vote, we're not moving now to you know nine point four because nine point three. There's some unfinished business within nine point three. What what is the appropriate way to to indicate a pause before moving forward to the next item? In my first thought, and I remember this issue came up at the last board meeting when we had an an, an amended motion, which by the way is proper. You can amend a motion, and I think. That was in response to Dr. Bo had an amendment. 
the proposed contract. And that's a perfectly acceptable thing to do in, in Robert's roles. And it also does not violate the Brown Act. So my suggestion is when we go off road like that, I think we're going to have to do it in an analog type way. So if the system only allows for the recording of one electronic vote, that means we would have to have a, a written record. As long as we have a clear record that shows how each board member voted, then it allows us to get a little bit beyond the, what the system's capabilities are. Can I ask for clarification? Because I think the question was, let's pretend we're on 9.3, and then there's a split to vote. 9.3 is the one that takes both of those votes. You're not doing a 9.3, and now we have a second vote, so now we have to log a different number. That's correct. I think both vote would be under 9.3. Now, if you're sticklers and um, you prefer a, a linear way to kind of think about these things, technically you, you could say first vote was 931, second vote was 932. For me, I prefer to just keep it under 9.3 because that's the way you agendized it, and I don't want it to look sloppy later. But it does put, you know, the, the clerk who's recording all this is probably going to capture one vote electronically, and the other vote will be in the board's minute. All right. But ultimately, if you do get to a place where somebody says point of order, I think there's been a breach in the rules, it would be the chair who would kind of rule on whether or not that was a, a, an infraction. And again, this is reserved for only kind of the major. Okay. So anyone can make a point of order, but only the chair rules. Correct. And it's not debatable and does not require a second. So, and, and the way I see this playing out would be, and I'll pick on um, Mr. Ronquillo here. Board member Ronquillo, I'm going to elevate you for one hypothetical. Board, board member Ronquillo says, you know, point of order. I think that motion's out of order. The board president looks, sees whether or not the motion is out of order, determines, no, that motion is not out of order. So the, there's no need for a point of order when then we move. Again, not something I've seen come up in the meetings, but we're going deep here. Please, Dr. Pro. Um, can we just go back one second? Sure. So um, could you role play with us through the procedural motion to split the votes? So if the original item was contract to clean the roof and clean the sidewalk. And we say, now we want to split it and vote on the contract for the roof and vote on the sidewalk. Can we spend a couple minutes to see exactly how, what that would look like? So I could say, um, I'd like to, so, so would I say, for example, I'd, um, I make, I'd like to make the procedural motion to approve vendor A to clean the roof. And then, so does that motion then need a second and then we vote? So where are we, how do we do that? And I think the way we would do it is, let's say, and, and I'm going to use the example we had last time with the, well, I'll stick with the hypothetical, but I think what we did last time was help, right? So first you have a motion and a second to approve the contract as written. So in the example I used, the cleaning sidewalks and cleaning rooftop. So there's a motion, there's a second. Now there's discussion on this contract to do both of those services. At that point, during the discussion, that's really the time to make that kind of procedural motion or really any amendment motion. During that period of time, a board member would say, um, I move that we separate these two issues because cleaning of the sidewalks, loaded issue, cleaning of the rooftops, totally different. It would come in during that discussion phase. And then there would be a second on the procedural motion to split. Then the board would vote. Then the motions would be split. And then you would have to kind of say, all right, now we're back to the main motion, which is the issue first, cleaning of the sidewalks. And after that, you all can consider the cleaning of the roof. So it would look like three votes. One is the, is the first, the second, and the vote to split the motion. And then it's a first, a second, and a vote for the sidewalk contract. And then a first, a second, and a vote for the roof contract. Correct. And, and here's why. Because let's say your, your procedural motion to split the two topics fails. Then you default and you're back to the original contract. And the, the original contract did both sidewalk and roof. And in making that procedural motion, um, do I use any different language be, I, beyond I make a motion to? I wouldn't. And, and honestly, I can come here and I can talk about point of order. I can talk about calling the question. I think all of that is going to muddle really the business of the board and what you came here to do. 
I think if if all your board members understand your true intent, which is I move that we separate these two issues and we consider one at a time, to me, that's more than sufficient to kind of have substantial compliance with the Robert's rules so that you can make sure that you're really adhering to, to the brand. I play devil's advocate. So I'm board member Ortega. The contract comes to the board to do floors and roofs. <clears throat> so I board member Ortega say, I make a motion to approve the contract. My colleague here, board member Mitchell, says, I second that motion. Now there's discussion. Then someone's going to say, another colleague of mine is going to say, well, I'd like to make a motion to split the contract. Why can't I say, wait, time out. My motion is still on the floor. Why does she get to now bring another motion that all of a sudden we're going to vote on? You forgot about mine. I think you can. I mean, you can lobby against that procedural motion, but ultimately that board member saying, let's split the two issues into one, that's an appropriate and it's not out of order. So you can certainly, as part of the discussion, you can, you know, you can let your intent and your disagreement with splitting the, mo the issues, you can let that be known. But ultimately, if the majority of the board decides to split the issues, it's appropriate and you move forward. So kind of picking back uh, with Mr. Arturo is saying, right, so we have a, a, a motion to move, uh, to split both issues, right? And so isn't it, so is it up to the chair to recognize that motion? Short answer, yes. It's up to the chair to recognize every person who's speaking. Can the chair deny the motion? The chair is not denying the motion so much as the chair is not recognizing somebody. And my caution there would be, this is discussion. It's been moved, it's been seconded. And a motion like that would be appropriate. So it, it, the chair wouldn't really have any basis to not recognize the person who was trying to make a motion. Now, that's a, that's a tougher call than, say, somebody who says, out of the blue, I want to make a motion right now to make October 12th Dodger Day in Azusa Unified School District. You already have a motion in front of you. Now, I see some heads in agreement. I'm from San Diego, and so I don't know that I agree with that all the way. But, but ultimately, you have a motion in front of you to clean sidewalks and rooftops. A motion to make it Dodger Day on October 12th would be out of order. So, again, I don't think the chair would say, I'm just going to ignore you in your Dodger motion. I think the chair would say, that motion is out of order at this time. And there may or may not be a discussion among the board members about whether or not it is out of order. But if it's completely unrelated to the main motion, chances are it's going to be out of order. You have to deal with the, mo the main motion first. And, and here's not quite a bumper sticker, but something that I think about is there really can only be one motion in front of the board at a time. And the idea is one motion at a time, you know, you can deal with each thing as they come. It has to be very linear. Procedural motions are what they are like secondary motions. They're not main motions. So the motion to, for example, separate the contract, that's a procedure motion. Board member Greer could also say, you know, we haven't studied the sidewalk cleaning and the rooftop cleaning nearly enough. I'm going to make a motion to table this contract until a subsequent meeting. I want to make a motion to send this particular issue to committee to be studied. Those would all be procedural motions that are acceptable and not main motions. I apologize. I'm going to keep playing devil's advocate here. Um, so let's, let's continue. We said, yes, it's, it's correct. I made a motion to accept the contract. I got a second. Um, my colleague, uh, Dr. Bo, uh, made an amendment to the motions. And so now I'm out of luck. So now Dr. Bo says, well, I'd like to make a, a motion, uh, to split this vote. I, I believe that we should, uh, vote for just the sidewalk and then the rooftop, uh, later. Uh, in a second vote, right? And she gets a second by board member Greer. What's to stop me? Uh, and then, then the board president would say, okay, any discussion? I'd like to, I'd like to amend the amendment. Um, I'd like to amend the amendment to say, uh, we're going to vote for, we're gonna, I, I agree, let's split the vote, uh, but let's do the sidewalks. But I'm, I make a motion to table the rooftops until next time. Like, where does it stop? Like, and I'm not saying that's going to happen. I just want to know procedurally, like, can we just keep amending, 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 amending 
and keep spinning our wheels. In my mind, all of these things require a majority of the board. And so I think that's where it stops. It stops at the necessity for getting a majority to agree that we actually need to separate this a third time. And so ideally, as part of your discussion, and this is, um, this is I think, a good reason for the chair, whoever is sitting in that, in that chair, to really allow the discussion to take place so that all the, all the pressure testing can be done before you even get close to the point where you're going to call the question. And so I'm, what I'm hoping in a situation like that, Superintendent Ortega, is that all the different nuances of why we can vote on the sidewalk cleaning and maybe not the rooftop cleaning, all of that has been hashed out through the discussion. So ideally, and, and I'll give you an example, not a hypothetical to your hypothetical, but if you're at the beginning of that discussion and there's already a procedural motion to separate the two issues, it might be a little early on in the process. It might be that we haven't really heard enough about what the issue is before we get to this point where we have to separate them. Because in a situation like that, what I can see happening is you have a motion, you vote on the sidewalk cleaning, and then there's a motion to table the rooftop cleaning. And then all of a sudden, as you get later on, everybody's thinking, why didn't we just deal with the rooftop cleaning when in front of us? So I think to, to your very serious hypothetical, I think the answer, you know, kind of how do you end silly season? And that's really in relying on the majority of the board. And so that's why it's critical that each motion, whether it's procedural or main motion, it really requires that majority. And the majority has to say, you know what? This is a good use of our time or potentially it's not. So, so when somebody, um, they, do, they, they, they have a procedural motion, then uh, it is recognized by the chair and the chair opens it up for the majority of the board to move forward with that not necessarily just uh, moving forward. Is my understanding correctly? Well, and, and let, me, let me make sure I'm, I'm saying it back so I'm understanding. In the scenario we all use, Dr. Bo comes in and says, I'd like to, to make a motion to separate the issue. Um, and I, I think the way this, this will play out in real time is Dr. Bo may raise her hand. We're all having a discussion about sidewalk cleaning, rooftop cleaning. We're all having a discussion. Dr. Bo may raise her hand and say, I'd like to make a motion. At that point, the chair would recognize Dr. Bo and would hear Dr. Bo's motion. Um, and, I'm, and, and this is the hard part for the chair, whoever's sitting in that, in that role, because the chair has to decide in the moment, is this a proper procedural motion or is it something completely out of line? And in the, the hypothetical we played out, it is a proper motion. So Dr. Bo says, I'd like to make a motion to separate the two issues. And um, the chair has recognized Dr. Bo. The motion is made. It's not out of order. Is there a second? And that's also another, uh, Superintendent Ortega, that's another place um, where you know whether or not the motion has legs. It may be that the motion gets no second. The motion gets no second. There is no second. Now, now we're going back to the original main motion, which was looking at both of these services being dealt with in one contract or at one time. Please. And, and just to be clear, going back to something you said earlier in the meeting. So, so we go through this process and we move forward. And Wednesday morning, we, we, we reflect back on the meeting and we realize that, oh, actually procedurally, that was, that was not, or, or there, there, there was a more appropriate procedural way to go about this. Even if there was a more appropriate procedural way to go about this, it does not, therefore, then necessarily invalidate the vote itself. Absolutely, 100%. And, and here's, here's where I'm hanging my hat, first of all. Unless I missed something, there's no reference to Robert's rules in the Brown Act itself, right? And the Brown Act is something that we have to adhere to. That's the law. But even beyond that, Board Member Greer, there aren't any board bylaws that show that the board has adopted Robert's rule. And so what that really means to me is that you are all adhering to Robert's rules because it's a helpful form of organization. And you had an exhibit for it at one point. As a matter of fact, my guess is, and if you look at CSBA resources and other resources for school boards throughout the state of California, my guess is there's going to be a lot of suggestions that Robert's Rules are the way to, to govern. And I know in the nonprofits I've been a part of, Robert's Rules are kind of everywhere. But ultimately, that, that minor violation of, of Robert's Rules does not invalidate last night's meeting. So jumping into some of the motions, we talked about some of these things, but the chair must open for the motions and the chair is going to recognize any motion made 
Um, and if it's not germane, the motion is out of order. And I think, um, Board Member Arianas, that gets to your question earlier, is that, you know, what's the role of the chair? And the bottom line is if, if the motion is relevant, you would recognize the motion. But the tricky part may be that it may be a completely different motion. It may be irrelevant. So those are the things you have to wade through in the moment. Now, in the meetings I've observed, I haven't seen any irrelevant motions at all. You know, one or two, one or two questions um, or one or three questions about how do we proceed through this, you know, amendment, but nothing that was kind of out of left field. Ultimately, and this goes to Superintendent Ortega's point, you have each motion has to be seconded. You're going to get into discussion. Then ultimately, the majority of the board has to approve that motion before we move on. Now, I know that it doesn't always play out like this, but I'm, getting, I'm just going from like Robert's rules of order here. Typically, the moving board member gets the first opportunity to speak. Um, in the board meetings that I've observed, all the board members have an opportunity to speak. And, and often there was something that happened in one of the board meetings I was at where a board member said, you know, I'm, I'd like to collect my thoughts and I'll come, come back to me in a few minutes. And I thought that that was um, extremely helpful, both for, for the board member, but also for the board, so that the board knows there's a placeholder here, somebody else would like to kind of contribute. And I haven't seen any issues with board members having an opportunity to speak. Um, now, the moving board member can also withdraw their motion. So it may be that somebody jumps the gun and move to approve this contract. There's a discussion, and obviously there's second first. There's a discussion, and at some point, board member thinks, you know what? I've heard about this vendor that's going to be cleaning the sidewalk, the rooftops. This does not sound like somebody who we want to be in business with in Azusa. That board member can withdraw their motion. And does the second become the motion or it's, it, it now pauses for a motion and a seconding? If the board member withdraws their motion, the main motion is no longer there. Yeah. Now, now here's a, let's, let's just get difficult, right? So uh, there is a motion by um, board member Greer to approve the sidewalks and rooftop cleaning. There's a second by Dr. Bo. There's some discussion. And in that discussion, ultimately, board member Greer decides I'm no longer going to support this motion. I want to withdraw my original motion. At that point, it may be that Dr. Bo says, well, I'm the one that seconded this motion. And I still think this is a good vendor. I think we still need to clean the sidewalk. At that point, Dr. Bo can move to approve the contract. Um, funky, you know, but sure, these things could happen. Would they need a second? Absolutely. Because at, at that point, there is no, the, the original motion has been withdrawn. So we are starting from scratch. And, and there's one other thing about starting from scratch in all these different dueling motions and reconsideration. And this actually came up for the board a few meetings ago in the context, I think, of a public hearing. And there's something that I've, I've seen um, multiple chairs here in, in Azusa do, almost like a pause, right? So kind of in, in my line of work, you know, if somebody's asking a question, you always give a pause just to see how other people are going to react, if somebody else is going to have a comment to make. I think you want a little bit of a pause before you jump to the next agenda item. Because once you start jumping to the next agenda item, then now arguably, you may not have a Robert's Rules issue. You may have a Brown Act because you've already moved on to a completely different agenda item. So, and I think this came up in the context of somebody wanting to make an additional comment on a particular item. And you hadn't moved forward to the next agenda item. So in my mind, it was still proper to make a comment. But that can be an issue. And now, Robert's Rules doesn't really have that limitation. Robert's Rules is a little bit more like you can make a motion for reconsideration at any point in the meeting. I think if it could be problematic if you approve something at the beginning of the night and all of a sudden you're trying to reconsider that same thing at the end, that could be a, a Brown Act problem, not a Robert's Rules issue. Can we role play that? Because I, I think it's really important. One thing that you're seeing as we are moving forward with the agenda, right? We're using Robertson Rules of Order, but the violation of a Brown Act is when we have first uh, the first motion, second motion, we voted, and one of us still wants to speak about the motion, the the agenda item. That's a violation. Well, and and I'm stealing one of my hypotheticals here. What I'm emphasizing here, and, and there's two different issues, and I don't want to mix these two issues up. I think the, the issue of somebody making a comment about something that you've already moved on for the, for, from, I think that's a truly really minor issue, right? And so I think in a situation like that, where let's say 
we had just got done with item 9.1. And okay, any other comments? All right, we're moving on to 10.1. And somebody says, oh, wait, I have a comment about 9.1. In my mind, that is not a, a Brown Act issue or anything that you really need to be concerned with. Um, that's just somebody remembering that they had something they wanted to say. That happens all the time. So can we talk about that, just sure. about public hearings, because that was something that happened with me. So I am, I feel like we are, when we have our meeting, we're not having a public conversation with the public, right? So I, I would feel uncomfortable for us to be participating during the public hearing conference, because at any one point, anybody could come up to do our conversation and say, I have a comment about this. And then we would have to have them, allow them to have that, have that. So either we, I mean, from, in my mind, we either have our conversation before the public hearing or after the public hearing, but I would not, if we're having our conversation be in the public hearing, then we are actually inviting the public to have a conversation with us about the item. So I, w I have a concern procedurally about doing things that, that way. And I see your point. If the board members are making comments during the public hearing, it takes on more of the optics that the board members are having a conversation with the public, which I'm sure in all of your governance training, you're told not. So not optics, but it actually, I mean, it opens the opportunity, right? Because somebody could stand up and say, well, I have a comment. It's public hearing. I'd like to speak to them. So you're actually, it's not, it's not that we're in, it's not optics. We're actually doing it in a, in a form that is allowing that conversation to happen. Well, and I'm imagining a scenario where a member of the public makes a comment and the board member makes another comment. It, one comment may not be necessarily directly linked to the other. Um, and to be honest with you, I haven't seen anything in the CVRA or the Brown Act that talks specifically about um, when board members should make comments during public hearing. I mean, just to, just to put it out. I think so. But the, the board member cruising is all this point. It, it sounds like I, I make a comment. And based off of what I say, someone from the public says, or, or, you know, we ask, does anyone have anything? And people say no. Then after that, since it's still public, uh, open, you know, open public meeting or, or, or hearing, then we ask, does anyone on the board have something? So I say, yeah, actually, I have, I have something I want to say. Then after I say what I want to say, someone from the public says, based on what Adrian just said, now I have a comment. So they come up, make a comment. And then based off of that, I respond back. We're, we're now actually engaging in, in dialogue, not, not, not just optic. It, it, would, it would actually be dialogue. And in that hypothetical, you are. And, and let me tell you, the really easy way for board member Greer to stop that exchange is to, to simply not respond to the member of the public. But it may be that you had a comment, the member of the public had a comment. That's it. Um, and let's just, and so let's play this hypothetical out. Um, let's say that your comment was, um, I'm going to run out of hypotheticals here, was, it was about that the sidewalk cleaning would be up to three inches of the curb, right? So that was, that was your comment. And then you get a board member who says, you know, when you go to three inches of the curb, you're putting all kinds of pollutants down the gutters. And that's going to be a problem downstream. And um, I don't think that's something that Susan wants to do. Instead of responding to a member of the public, I would say just like any issue before you, you might direct, um, you know, not to put you on the spot, Superintendent Ortega, but you might direct that comment and say, Superintendent Ortega, is there something more that you can tell us about, um, you know, pollutants getting into the gutters or something more that staff can tell us? Or it might be one of those issues where let's have staff look into that and come back. Um, I think in, in our situation with the CVRA issue, there were consultants here, right? There was an expert who was there to speak about that particular issue. And I believe that person answered the question, whatever it was. So I do think there is a way to not necessarily directly engage with that member of the public in a way that's problematic, but to also potentially get any answer that may be in the room um, to kind of move along the, the conversation. And I use your hypothetical because it actually is part of the counter argument, right? The counter argument is if you've ended the public hearing and then there's a comment, then the member of the public doesn't have an opportunity to respond to that. Or, and this kind of comes up with witness questioning all the time. And there's something, you know, cross examination, then redirect, right? So if somebody asks you a question on cross examination, then, you know, you need a chance to redirect and kind of say, oh, board member Greer just said something I hadn't even thought about. What about those pollutants down? So that could be something that kind of triggers um, a member of the public having an additional comment. Either way, again, let me go back to the main point. I haven't seen anything specifically in the Brown Act or the CBRA that governs how you do. It. And so until I see anything that says, you know, there's a right or wrong way, I would say 
the main thing I would try to do is make sure all of the comments are within that agenda item. Okay. Did you have? So, so if a board member would like to write, to make a comment, um, just to understand this correctly, we do a, we, we, we open up the hearing, right? We, we, uh, motion. Now it's open hearing. We have a couple people from uh, the, the public come and speak. And then the board members speak. I've seen it done both ways. So that I'm, way, the, right. So that way we're the, we're the last ones. I, I just, I, I guess my, my question is, for example, um, say I wanted to, to, to go ahead and have a discussion before before have before the public hearing about the public hearing can we do that well if if we have an item on the agenda is the question whether or not we can board members can have a discussion about an item on the agenda and it's marked assume info and action and in my mind in, an item like that there yes there would be board discussion. that board discussion may fall before the public hearing may fall after. So it, it would have to be labeled in, on the agenda info action for us to be able to do that. Typically, yes, that's when the discussion is going to happen. Now, we can go home and we can all watch tons of, of board meetings. I bet you dollars to donut. You're going to find that sometimes when it does action, there's still some discussion outside of the discussion. But again, this takes us back to Robert's rule. The idea is whatever the motion is, the discussion is going to happen once there's been a motion and a but, but let me let me address, I think, a, a deeper point that gets to kind of the beginning. If there is a minor faux pas like that, if there is a comment that comes in, and by the way, there's no rule saying it has to be this way or that way. I would say if somebody does something in a way that is, seems slightly out of order, my point is it does not invalidate the board's action. That's the critical take. Um, and the board can talk, and I think this is probably the context, right, a governance training. The board can talk about their own bylaws, their own handbook, how they would like to see things handled. But I think in a situation like that, as legal counsel, I would not be losing sleep that there was comment after technically after the public hearing closed, but before the next matter got called. I would say, well, we're still within that matter, so we can move <laughs> forward. Please. Just to split, I'm, I, this might be splitting hairs. So we're on 9.3. You know, again, we say, uh, you know, anyone have anything to add? No. All right, moving on to item 9.4. Actually, wait, I do have something on 9.4. So, it, similarly, correct me if I'm wrong. You're all, you are saying similar to, to um, not losing a whole lot of sleep over which, uh, you know, which side of public comment. Uh, there's, there's a comment from a board member. If something like that were to happen, you don't see, you, you see neither a brown neck violation nor any type of major procedural error that would invalidate or, or, or where it would make it improper for, for that comment to be made to revert back to 9.3 and then move on to 9.4, even if it's not most appropriate or preferred, would you say that, it's, that it doesn't invalidate it and, and that board member can still be heard? Yes. Short answer, yes. In that moment, I would say, haven't, even if you had said, I think we're on a 9.4 and somebody says, oh, wait, wait, I did have a comment. In my mind, that is not a Brown violation. That just kind of uh, the decorum getting a little loose as somebody kind of remembered something. Right. I think that's probably the, the best way to address it. Um, how, how about if it keeps happening? I, I'm just hypothetically speaking, not that it has, but it keeps happening at every like board meeting where somebody from the board uh, will want to speak right, um, right before the motion or after we voted. And it becomes like, well, I, I mean, because it's it's not best practice, but it it becomes a nuisance. Well, we we talked earlier about there being off, right? And so, if this were something that were coming up, um, and I, I, if I were on the board, I might be that person that always has their best thought after everybody's already gone and the issues moved on. So I might be the person doing that. But I think ultimately having that pause built in. Okay, board. Anybody anybody else in the room would like to contribute to this topic before we move on? Hearing nothing, are we going to move forward? I think we try to build in some things like that. Now, I didn't spend a lot of time kind of preparing for there be breaches and etiquette among the board because 
what I've seen from the board, there haven't been anything that's been deliberate or anything like that. But if but if you had a problem like that, like if somebody was deliberately trying to intervene and kind of upset the meeting, there's there's a whole other path that you can look at in terms of kind of board member action. But for, for my part and for boards, healthy boards, healthy boards don't really go down that road because ultimately it consumes a lot of time and ultimately it doesn't really change anything. Um, but let me let me get back to board member Greer's hypothetical. I want to make it just a little bit harder. Public hearing is closed. Board member Greer, we've moved on to 9.4. Board member Greer says, oh, you know what? Um, I had something to say about 9.3. And board member Greer makes a statement. At that point, a member of the public says, you know what? I forgot it was something I had. Um, and, and so in that point, in, and most of you are here because you have a background in education. You've been on the board. You're here. You are empathetic people. You want to, you know, improve the schools and, and have great public education in Azusa. In, in that point, you probably will say, okay, we have one more public comment. Even though technically the public hearing has closed, in a situation like that, once you crack open the door for the board member, just keep in mind, you don't necessarily want to slam the door public. And this is this weird place where have you violated Robert's rules? No. But let's say you say, board member Greer, um, just to pick on you a little bit, board member Greer makes this statement. Then the member of the public says, well, I, I, you know what, that made me think of something and, and it really should be two inches from the curb. And board member Greer happens to be the chair and board member Greer says, nope, public hearing's over. We're not going to hear that public comment now. That potentially gives that member of the public the right to say, you know what, I was denied the right to participate in this meeting. And then it becomes a murky map, kind of when the public hearing closed, when it opened. So I think to, to the board president's point earlier, there is a reason why you want to have the meeting run efficiently, why you want to have the comments come in the appropriate time. Because once you do crack open the door, it can present other issues. But I, again, haven't seen that, but we're just, we're throwing out A to Z hypothetical. Dr. Bo? Um, just one last clarifying question regarding the rules of engagement for public hearings. So are um, members of the public supposed to sign up for a speaker card the way they do during public comment on regular agenda items? Do they, are we asking them to do that for a public hearing? And, and I don't know what the practice here is in Azusa, whether or not you've asked for those. For those. And I'm getting some nods around the table and maybe I'm getting some no's around the table. My, my thought is I'll just throw myself out there before I even know the practice. It's a public hearing. The whole point of a public hearing is to have public participation. So if somebody were actually in the room or they were raising their hand um, and saying, I want to contribute to this public hearing, um, in my mind, we wouldn't say, sorry, we didn't get a speaker card from you, so therefore we can't recognize you. Please. Yeah, but I do recall when we have a public hearing, we'll say, is there anyone in the audience who would like to? And they come to the podium, so they don't necessarily have to fill a card. That's I appreciate it. So this time, I, I my thought was aligned with the procedure. So I get a small victory for that. Please, board member. So, so it sounds like this is there. there is the potential for any public hearing to create a bit of an interesting procedural mess. There, there, there is the potential there. It, it would appear to me that what, it, what, what seems to be most clean in, in this kind of situation is to ask for public comment and before closing the public comment asking board members to speak if they have something to say and then closing the you know and then closing the public comment it, it would it would appear to me that the, it it has every scenario has the potential to be to be messy but in so doing there is there are there's a clear open and close of of public comment and it is incumbent upon us as board members to not engage in the dialogue i would agree with that I, I would agree with that there's not, I've not seen a rules written down, but I do think that as you make minor deviations, that's what Robert's rules is, right? It's decorum, it's the etiquette, having a clean meeting. When you start making minor deviations, it's a slippery slope. It could lead to another situation or what happens more often than not board member Greer, or it, it doesn't turn into anything and um, you live to fight another day. So I just, I mean, I, again, what you just pointed out is a scenario that I have concerns about because technically the public hearing is still open so somebody could come up and would be within their right to give so that's why like i feel comfortable most comfortable giving any comments once 
the public hearing is done, right? The debate, you know, that public input is done and now we're having, we're talking about it. Um, but that's not what you just laid out. Right. And, I, and I'll say as, as when you made your point initially, I think I said, you know, makes, makes sense. And I'm on, I'm on team that. And then when Carlos, when you described, yes, but let's keep in mind, if a board member makes a comment and then someone from the public says, wait, I have something that I, I, I want to add, then it's, it is potentially that we, it, it, it is, you know, we have the potential of a Brown Act violation if, if we restrict that person and not allow them to speak. So, so if, if that's the case, and if, and if we were, if we were going to need to be open to someone speaking after a board member spoke anyway, then, it, then there's no, then there's, you know, hypothetically no way around that, what you're describing. But see, I would, I would, I would just say, I, I'm not sure that would be a Brown Act. I just think, think about just our, one of our regular action items, right? Um, we have public comment before the action item. We have conversation about it. If someone in the audience were to raise their hand and say, oh, I have a comment about that, we would not stop and say, oh, please share your opinion with us because you forgot to mention that earlier. I mean, their time and space is during public comment. Their time and space is during the public hearing. I mean, we have the luxury as board members to have more time and space because we're the elected board. I think the, the difference in those hypotheticals is the public hearing is kind of a weird thing within a public board meeting. And um, I, I think that's the, the slightly different scenario. Is, and, and you're absolutely right. There are time and place restrictions for public comment. And the rule under the Brown Act is you have to give the public the opportunity to speak before or during the time when the, the action is being considered. And you, you have by, bylaws. Once the time has elapsed, the board will move on with its business. Um, so you're absolutely right. The only weird thing is when it comes to these public hearings, and, and by the way, um, the public hearings are also required for the sunshining of the proposals for, for collective bargaining. So it just kind of, it, it, it makes it seem like it doesn't matter if you submitted a public comment card. This is a free-for-all where the public can now kind of weigh in. So, so are there time limits or guidelines? I mean, does that, does that mean a member of the public can speak for an hour and the next person can speak for an hour and it goes on? And the short answer is I would probably apply our normal public comment guidelines to that section. And I'm guessing that's something we've never done or the district board has never done because it's never been an issue. So I, I've actually seen the last few, I think a couple on the CVRA and then a couple on the sunshining. And in the public hearing, I don't think there was a single comment during that time. But to your point, if all of a sudden somebody comes loaded to bear and they got a stack of cards, I might kind of lean in as the chair and say, just a reminder that we have limitations on public comment. Um, but again, I haven't haven't looked at that issue and then looked at it in the context of a public hearing. So I think I think we may have to look at that more and say, do our normal public comment period timelines apply to the public hearing? But I've never had that question. Please. So, so would the ch uh, chair uh, announce like like he or she does uh, when public participation, letting them know that they have a certain amount of time? you know, how, how you read that article that says, you know, you are allowed to speak three minutes. So they know, you know, that it's not an hour long and they know their time. I think they can. And, and then who, who who's keeping the time? Because we should put it up on the board, you know, uh, during public participation. So who who's keeping the time of the person that's going to speak? My response, it would be, it'd be the same time and the same uh, person who keeps time for normal public that we would follow the same process. The tricky part here is that it sounds like it's never been an issue. So it's a great hypothetical, Dr. Bo. Um, definitely put me on my heels because I've been thinking about that is, is public hearing, is a public hearing different um, substantively than public comment? And I think there's an argument. You, public hearing yeah. lasts until, until it's over. So I'm going to have to come back to you on, on that one. But to the extent that you are going to apply time limits, I think you do it in the same way that you apply time limits to public comment. Since um, since we're speaking about with uh, our regular uh, agenda, so so for example, we have um, people that are coming in to our meetings uh, now through Zoom, and they're having a dialogue and asking questions. Are we required to answer those questions? It's, they've already, they did not come to public comment or maybe they did and they used that time, but now they're having a dialogue because of what we are talking about, right? 
and they're asking questions. So my question to you is, are we required to answer back? No. And, and I, I'm assuming that you mean in the context of a public hearing. Public, no, no, I think so. I think regular board meeting. I think regular you're talking board. about Zoom chat and Zoom, Zoom chat Q and A, and but that's correct. Right. What are we doing now with that? That's being disabled. But but I do think it's a it's a good point generally, and you probably hear in all the governance training. And I think um, one of the board members was talking about this earlier. Is that in your role, you're not engaging directly with the public from the diet. Please. So, so now I'm I'm going to bring it to to in person. And um, for example, we're we're having you know a regular um, 9.3, and we're talking about reconfiguration and possible closures of X schools. And we have audience, and they're speaking up and standing up, right? And it's out of control. Then what? Then we would jump to a completely different section of your bylaw. And there's some language in there about, and I actually have a hypothetical about this. Um, so I'll, I'll, I won't steal all my thunder. But the idea is if somebody is actually interfering with the conduct of the meeting, that person can be removed. And so this is something that's actually happening at board meetings throughout the state, is you have different movements that are opposed to certain mandates from the state, from local authorities. And so this is happening. You have bylaws about decorum and about interference, please. And also, um, the chair can also um, take a break, right? We could take a break. There could be a, a brief a recess. recess that's as, the word. As, yes, to kind of calm the audience and then return, right? But it's up to the chair. Yes. Right? The short answer, yes. Yeah. Right, yes. Yeah. And, and I think, um, fortunately, there's, you know, there's not a disruptive crowd for Robert's rules, but I'm hoping that this holds, right, yeah. throughout the rest of your meetings, um, because because if you do get to that point, now, now here's here's some parsing here, you know, what? and I think we all got to think about this. My mom was a teacher for over 40 years, and she was a um, very dedicated PTA member, and so they used to come to board meetings, and they used to all wear their red T-shirt. And, you know, at the right moment, they may all stand and turn their back. Or they may, you know, hold up a fist, all of them in unison. And so what you have to really weigh is, as a board member, you may be offended by that silent protest. But that silent protest may not be interfering with the board's business. But we do have to kind of keep a balance here that, you know, expression in a way that does not interfere with the, the board meeting is acceptable. Interfering with the board meeting is not. Which now leads me to, um, I don't know if this is the right question to ask at this time, but um, I've only seen um, one time where um, I, the board chair at that time used the, the gavel, right, to, to, to go into recess. When is this, when is this you? <laughs> yeah, and, I, and I, I, don't. I didn't see any, I didn't see any bylaws on that either. Um, but the idea of, you know, gaveling in and gaveling out has always made sense to me. Um, so, I, so, I mean, I've seen it like, you know, in legislation where they open up the meeting and they're doing that, they're adjourning, they're doing that. So, I mean, is this something we adopt? Is this, when do I get to, or the chair gets to? <laughs> well, I'll defer, I'll defer to the board on the appropriate gavel use, but I'll tell you this. I had a gavel once and I didn't use it. Um, it just felt like, you know, it was kind of there. It was um, almost decorative, you know, but I do think the idea you gavel in, you gavel out, you know, and you know what, um, and I'm, I'm, I'm being a little glib, but the reality is let's, let's go back to that scenario you were talking about where there's a disruptive crowd, right? And so in, in that moment, there's a lot of people talking, they're interfering, and you may say something like, you know, the board is going to stand in recess for 10 minutes as orders restored. And it may be the appropriate time to, to hit the gavel. Going to get people's attention, board then stands up, you're in recess. So, um, so it's, it's funny to think about, but there are situations where you may need to use the gavel. Please. So, so the board walks out of the room or that we stay seated and stand or, or what, what do we do? It really, in my mind, it depends on the situation. So if if we're looking at, like, there's a hostile crowd and there's some concern about safety, in a situation like that, I may say, you know what, the recess 
board members need to remove themselves. And, and I don't want to be, I don't want to be an alarmist, but you are going to have to make a lot of difficult choices and you're going to have to have a lot of very public discussions of hard things for the community. And I'm thinking beyond just what's on your agendas for the next few months. I'm thinking about the governor's mandates and things like that as well that are going to make life a lot more interesting for elected officials. And so to me, it depends. If, if there's any risk, um, I'm sure Superintendent Ortega and staff are going to make sure to deal with that. It's also not uncommon for law enforcement to have to be present at board meetings. Some board meetings have law enforcement at every meeting. Um, and I'm not saying that that's the appropriate way to go. It just, it happens. I've seen it. Um, in some places, it's a way of life. Okay, but getting back to Robert's rules, I'm going to move forward here. All right. We talked a little bit about amending motions, and, and you know any board member can move to amend the motion. You just state what the amendment is. And I thought, um, Dr. Bo, I, I kind of at the moment I really appreciated that you were doing that because it was a great kind of practical application of amending a motion when we went through that um, that discussion last time. So there was a motion to amend, needed a second, then the chair called for a discussion of the amended motion. Ultimately, the amended motion was passed. And so that became the main motion um, before the board. Now here's, here's a little one too. I think there was a question earlier and it's a little counterintuitive. This is when we ran into the trouble with the system. The first motion is just whether or not, the first vote is just whether or not you're going to amend. That's the first vote. Because if Dr. Bo says, I want to amend the original motion to add a, um, a meal component to the nutrition contract. And if that motion fails, then you default to what the contract is. And so that's why you have that first vote of whether or not the amended motion is going to be before the board. Once the amended motion, if it passes, is before the board, then the board's going to vote on that motion. At that point, it is the main motion. There is mud, but the board did get through that last time. Can you repeat that? <laughs> Probably using much different words, but the, but the like idea a, would right. The, the idea would be something like uh, I'm sorry, board member Cruz. Well, are you trying to say that we would do the procedural motions by just by voice voice vote and then take the actual motion, the action, mo the final motion, made motion with the computer? We haven't had a chance to talk about the the system's capabilities, but I think that makes sense. It only has the ability to do take. Well, we can ask. I hope can respond, but yeah, it only takes one. And, and, I, and I think your idea makes sense, right? Have the procedural motions be a recorded in the in kind of analog and then save system for the final main vote. But I think, I think in the last scenario, though, we actually had two motions that needed to be. It wasn't it wasn't like procedural than then the, the main motion. It was like two main motions, two different things on the same item. And, and I think that was the meeting I wasn't present at. Because the one I remember was the amended motion that Dr. Bo had done. And so then you had, um, but once that amendment came in, it supplanted the original motion. Please. So if, if I can go back there for a second, um, to, to, that, to that evening when we, we had that, the amended motion and some conversation around that. And it got, it got a little, you know, we, we lost our way a little bit, but, but found our way and, and got back on track. When, when that took place, I think that happened on the heels of us having the conversation on should we or should we not have legal counsel present at, at our at school board meetings? And I want to say, I think that, you know, especially hearing you share about the not, uh, uh, warning, cautioning us not to conflate a Brown Act violation and a, and a Roberts Rules of Order parliamentary, you know, procedural violation, if you will. Um, it seemed to me that, no, no, no offense to, to you, Carlos, it, it, it seems to me that you, your presence being at the, at the meeting, it, it actually invited more back and forth confusion around do we this or do we that and and when it, if if there was a slight you know error in, in 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 process but we knew where we were going and now we're trying to dance and backtrack to get back on the proper procedural it, it, it seemed to me that it took it, it would have taken more it took more time to try to right the wrong than it would have been to say that that was weird but i know what you meant let's move forward Duly noted. <laughs> so, so I, so I thank you. So I guess I, I guess I, I, I bring that up to, to, to say. I mean, as we, 
as, as we're looking at, at at some of these pieces and um you know one one of the things that you also mentioned is is understanding intent and understanding intent of 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 uh, of our colleagues here so i i i i would hope you know that that as we are moving forward and are are certainly going to make you know slight errors here or there that i i i would love it if if we still moved forward and and, and didn't get uberly caught up on on you know, process complications All right, so kind of circling back, and I appreciate your comments, board member Greer. Circling back, just to kind of close the conversation on amending motions. Um, once, and I think you had asked me to kind of go through that process. And so I want to use that example. There was a motion on the floor um, to approve the nutrition contract. There's a motion, there's a second. Now there's discussion on the nutrition contract. At that point, um, and I'm not, I'm not paraphrasing this exactly, Dr. Bo, I'm sure it didn't didn't go exactly like this, but at, at this point, there is an amendment to the original contract, which is to add something in there about healthy choices or, or menu options. Once, once there is a motion, and so the chair recognized there's a motion to amend the original motion. At that point, um, Dr. Bo got a second. And then the board president called the question, meaning you're all going to vote on the amended motion, and that vote passed. So when that vote passed, it means it planted the original motion. So the amendment process passed, not the vote itself, the amendment process, right? And so once that uh, amendment process passes, then the board had to vote a second time on the actual motion, which included the amended from Dr. Pope. So there's mud, but that's kind of how it happened. So when, um, when the motion is amended, and we have the recording secretary asking again, like, what was that motion again? Like, who is re repeating it back, the chair or the person who motioned? Ideally, to pick on the chair, probably the chair in that point, because all things go through the chair. That's why it's not, um, not, a, it's not a great job in terms of having to kind of be a board member in the moment, but also having to follow all the process and protocol of what's happening. In my mind, the chair is going to be the one who keeps everybody great and kind of says, no, 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 here's the motion. I'm going to repeat it. Now, in practice, in practice, I don't think it would be unusual for Dr. Bo to, to respond and say, you know, when um, Hope is looking for clarification of what the motion was, in practice, I can see Dr. Bo saying the motion was and kind of reading from whatever Dr. Bo had written down. And so I think that's probably to your point, Board Member Greer, that's another example of Robert's rules, a strict reading would say that comes right back through the chair. In practice, it might get a little looser than that. Dr. Bo may have the amended motion right in front of her that she's written on the fly. And then the important thing is that Hope is able to record it in the minutes and that everybody's clear what's being voted. Okay. All right. So, and I thought we weren't going to have nearly enough to talk about, but uh, we're going to push the three hours here. So uh, quickly, just on procedural motions, we talked about a few of these. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time. I think the important thing to remember is that these are mechanisms to deal with whatever the main motion is, right? So you can postpone the consideration of that. You can refer it to a committee. You could even limit discussion and create special rules for the motion, um, or you can divide it up into subtopics. Sub now, Robert's Rules, you know, a very long resource. It has a lot of things in it. So I'm not suggesting that we're going to go out there and read Robert's rules and come back with the most convoluted, complicated way to do business. The bottom line is if things are working for you, you know, by all means, don't change the way that you're considering agenda items. Again, making sure that everything is properly agendized under the Brown Act, that's my number one concern, and making sure that all the board members get an opportunity to speak to a particular issue. I think that's what's critical in making sure that there's public participation. Um, so Robert's rules can be convoluted. Now, postponement, we're just going to kind of break down a few of these. I'm not going to spend too much time. But bottom line is once it's postponed, no further action is taken on the matter until reopened. So board member Greer, this kind of goes to, to your point. There are minor things that you can say, well, well, wait, I didn't get a chance to say something on 9.3. There's other things here that, like, let's say, for example, the board has decided on a procedural motion by board member Cruz Gonzalez to delay or postpone the sidewalk cleaning and roof cleaning contract. 
and the board votes on that, it's postponed. Later on in the meeting, it'd be problematic for anybody to come and say, you know what, let's get back to that contract because um, I want to think we should vote on it now. And here's why. This is when I think Robert will start veering potentially into the ground. Act. Let's say I'm a member of the public and my passion is sidewalk cleaning and, and rooftop cleaning. Um, and maybe my brother-in-law is the vendor. Maybe I just really, really wanted to hear that conversation. The moment the board postponed consideration of that particular item, I packed up, and, and you see this happen in board meetings. I packed up and said, well, okay, my issue won't be tonight. I'm heading home. So if that member of the public then hears, well, you know, the board kind of rearranged things and they ended up voting on that at the very end, the board member can say, or a member of the public can say, I didn't have an opportunity to participate. I thought it was going one way and it ended up going a different way. So you see things in Robert's rules, like, for example, motions for reconsideration of an issue that in practice, but because of the Brown Act, might be problematic. So again, Robert's rules is a guide. Brown Act is something that we have to make sure we're adhering to. Carlos, <clears throat> uh, postponement uh, is another way of saying tables, correct? Absolutely. Okay. And so, and in practice, I've heard them use, you know, you know synonym, synonymous. Um, and do you want to elaborate, Board Member Cruz Gonzalez, on the, on the difference? I don't want to move too quickly. No, I don't. I personally don't know the difference, but I know they are two separate motions. Yeah. And they, you, they, you treat them differently, but I don't like. I think. Like Carlos, I mean, I think the most the most important thing is that we run the meeting efficiently. So sometimes that feels like that. And Carlos, can we get uh, as a follow up um, more delineation between tabling and postponing, so that when we are um, moving an item that way, we know we're exactly the date to which or the time to which we're postponing or tabling. Sure, we, we can look into that. And I want to make a mental list here that it's the public hearing, whether there's limitations on public comments, and then maybe unpacking a little bit of the tabling versus postponing. One, one issue that I think can be problematic for a public school district board that's complying with the Brown Act is, let's say you are at item 1.4. And for whatever reason, maybe there's people in the public who should be at the meeting, they're running late, or for whatever reason, there's initially some discussion, and then you decide we're going to table that issue to the end of the meeting. Um, that can get a little weird depending on whether or not somebody believes they didn't have a right to participate. So Dr. Bo, let me, let me drill down on those concepts and get something back to the board. Okay. Now, can we um, go back to the motion for reconsideration? Because we did, so one time we did have to do something like that. Um, and so we actually ended up agendizing it at the next meeting. And then it was officially reconsidered by somebody who had voted for it the first time. So we have done that, but it, we don't do it the same day. We, we, it only happened once. In 20 years, it's happened once, right? But then we, we voted on it at the next meeting. Uh, and, and as I, I was thinking about that on the, on the drive over here, and just um, what are the more, most likely scenarios that would potentially come up? And the motion for reconsideration was one that was kind of troubling me because ultimately, if you have a motion for reconsideration kind of comes in at the end of the meeting, let's say you decided an issue, you voted on it. I think a member of the public could say, hey, I was there for the first vote. I wasn't there for the second. I didn't have a right to participate. They could also say your agenda was all mixed up and things were being called when they shouldn't have been called. So I, I like that approach that a motion for reconsideration would happen at the, at the next meeting. And this actually goes, Board Member Greer, a little bit to your point earlier, which is it could be problematic. And this is the difference between Robert's Rules and Brown Act. We're on 9.3. There has been a vote on 9.3. That contract has been approved. Now we've moved on to 9.4. And we're now on to 9.5. And then somebody says, oh, wait, I want to do a motion for reconsideration of 9.3. In my mind, that would be problematic. It would be problematic for the Brown Act. It would be um, for HOPE. And I just kind of think that uh, the, the example that you use, Board Member Cruz Gonzalez, of having that motion at the next meeting, that makes perfect sense. And here's a, here's a scenario. We, we were actually working on um, hypotheticals, and I had somebody um, grilling me about what to do in this situation. What situation. So as I, I was role-playing this in preparation for the meeting, the, we use this example of um, what normally happens. Like, let's say you approve the contract, and all of a sudden, after you approve the contract, you get a ton of feedback from the community. And the community says, you know what? Um, that's not a reputable vendor. 
or a full three inches, two inches from the curve thing. You guys really need to study that and get that figured out. So I could see a scenario, and I don't know if this has happened over the recent history, but I could see a scenario where the board decides, you know what, maybe we need to rethink that particular contract that we approve. Now, and um, this is where we start getting a little bit into Latasha's purview, and we would have to look at, well, if the contract's already been accepted, is there anything in there about changing the terms of the contract after the fact? Um, and so those are kind of different downstream issues. But I do see a motion for reconsideration. I like it in most instances if you're going to be doing it at the next board. Okay. All right, adjourning. Um, I've seen you all adjourn. I don't see any issues there, but ultimately you got the board must motion to adjourn and any board member can make a motion to adjourn and must be seconded. All right, we talked a little bit about reconsideration, motion to revisit a topic already voted on, may occur in the current meeting or in the two subsequent meetings. And I'm, I'm really pulling from, from Robert's rules there. Um, and only one motion for reconsideration per sub. Again, you are not strictly bound to Robert's rule. So when I have these pieces in here in your slides, just know I'm either pulling them from your old exhibit or I'm pulling them for, for Robert's rule. I think the board member Greer's point, um, as long as you're effectively doing the board's business, that's the main goal. You're complying with the Brown Act. The public knows what you're doing. But an opportunity to participate. Those are, are the values that we need to get across. Okay, decorum. We talked a little bit about decorum earlier. And I have a couple of hypotheticals. If we have time to get to them, I don't know if we'll, we'll need them. But board members speak one at a time. And they don't interrupt each other. And um, unless the board member who has the floor yields to someone else. Now, again, I watch a lot of school district meetings. You know, I'm present for a ton of them. And there isn't always that kind of decorum where we say board member Viegas yield the board member vote. You don't really see that pomp and circumstance. But the idea is that one person is speaking at a time and that the board chair has recognized that one person. I think you do need that basic form of etiquette. Otherwise, it can be a little bit of a free form. Um, and I do think that at least keeping track of that, who's speaking, who has the floor, I think it's a it's a good way to stay organized and efficient in your meeting. I have a question on that. So, because um, earlier you had said whoever um, uh, moves the first motion, you know, usually gets to speak first. So then, I mean, theoretically, the second person who who seconds the motion would be the second. You know, and so. If there's a board member who, um, right, th that needs more, um, has questions come up, they didn't have a chance to to address it with cabinet before, therefore cabinet needs to do some more research, um, and that board member decides, well, I'm not comfortable voting on this because I, I don't have the appropriate um, information, right? So then they they table it. They, they asked it so they would uh, amend it or they would motion to amend, but the board doesn't agree. Motion to table. Yes. Or or motion to postpone, depending on what we find out after the research, but they would make one of those motions. Yes. So a motion to table is not debatable. So somebody, so, as soon as somebody says, I motion to table, there's not like, I don't. Oh, you can talk about talk if somebody the table what happens thank you yes yeah, so if well, somebody makes a motion to table what would and let's say there's discussion happening and someone says i move to table this item to the next in my mind that would be a procedural motion that would require a second and a majority of the vote and and so you know this kind of reminds me of a motion to adjourn so let's say that a meeting is not going the way somebody wants it to go and so they're they move to adjourn the meeting well the board, the rest of the board may have business to do. The rest, they may not get a second or a majority. And this goes back to the Superintendent Ortega's question of where does it all end? And the idea is, unless you have a second, unless you have a part of the majority of the board, you're not going to be tabling or postponing. Board Member Cruz Gonzalez, do you have something to share? Yeah. So if you look in this book on page number 12, like if you open the book, you can see like there's any kind of motion that you could possibly take. Like, so look the, on the top of on the right hand side, it says lay on the table, right? So if you open that up, you can re like to open up to 12, 
It's on the right, the right hand side at the top. See where it says 12? Open to that page. And then you can see there's all the read rules, but you can see in the middle it says whether it's debatable. No. So it requires a second, right? But once there's a second, there's no debate on the item. We just have to vote on it immediately. It requires a majority vote. Um, and somebody, if they, let's say it fails, they can try again after a while if they want. And you can, nobody can make any motions on, nobody can like do a amendment or anything to that. We have to vote just on that motion. Makes sense to me because it's strictly just an idea. Are we going to vote on this right now or are we going to vote it on later? So that makes sense to me. All right. So there's there's other parts of this that don't necessarily make sense. Um, and that's like only only board members talk, staff can answer questions if asked. In my practice, that's that's not usually how it goes. And usually the superintendent, superintendent, superintendent Ortega or, or other superintendents will usually weigh in. I have some information for the board. Let me help out. Or superintendent, superintendent Ortega may say, I think what we were considering was this. So the way I've seen staff engage is far more collaborative than from a pure, strict Robert's Rules reading and interpretation. Now, ultimately, we talked before about calling the question. So as the chair, the chair would choose when you're going to hold the question on, when you're going to call the question. And so, and really all that means is, can we have a vote on this particular and so I think in practice, the way I've seen it done and most boards is as long as there is a productive conversation going on, that discussion keeps going until you get to the point where everybody's kind of like, okay, we're ready to vote. I've all, you know, everybody's had a chance to contribute. Questions have been answered. You know, different points of view have been respected. At that point, you call for, please. So it would be good to talk about that, right? In terms of, um, because I think sometimes I feel like we, Sometimes um, it feels like we get into like, we, we end up hearing a lot of the same comments, right? And so it would be good to, to think about what's the best way to um, end a discussion when, it, when it's obvious that um, there are no new points are being made. I mean, I don't know. I don't have any ideas. How, I'm just saying I think it would be good to, to come to consensus on how to do that. Yeah, and it's harder than it sounds. It, it is because one thing I've observed about seeing boards in action is um, board members feel like they want to give some context for where they are and where they may potentially vote. And as a matter of fact, I think in your board bylaws, it says something to the effect of if you're going to abstain, you're going to offer some reason, or if you're going to vote against them. So, so that is a fine line, right? Between you know, explaining a little bit of why you vote for something um, and explaining a little bit of why you vote against it. Well, the general rule, that I've seen is, you know, every board member potentially has an opportunity to speak on the issue and, and there may be some redundancy. I think that's the crowd who wanted to hear the Robert Schools presentation. Please. I have a question on um, board members signaling, either outright stating how they're going to vote or signaling how they're going to vote and, it, and the appropriateness of that during the discussion prior to the vote. And it's tricky. It's tricky because there, there's a natural moment when the motion is being discussed, when, you know, I don't think any of us are professional poker players, but there's a moment where it, it becomes fairly obvious to, to the observer where a board member may be voting. But in, in my mind, when you're in discussion, that's when you're going to ask the tough question. That's when you're going to speak to a particular issue. And so it may be at that point, you can glean how a board member may vote. Where I think you really need to worry about that, Dr. Bo, is when you're outside of meeting, when you're making comments on social media and things like that. That's really where there's a danger, potentially somebody can say, you engaged in a serial meeting. You had you know, one idea here, and then there was another board member on, on social media, and all of that potentially could be a problem for the ground. Please. So, so then when, when would be, the, so... Our, yeah, our, our board protocol says that if we are going to vote against something, that we will articulate that why we're voting against. So then when is, is the appropriate time then during discussion or is it after the vote's been taken and then there's a time then for that person to say, I voted against this because? I've seen you all do it during discussion and it seemed organic for the moment. And so, and let's, let's play it out, right? Let's say that you have the vote and then each board member wants to explain 
it could get a little bit messy if the vote's already been taken. That doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, also, I've noticed that because of your system, the way it looks online, and, and maybe it feels a little different in person, the way it looks online is there's the discussion, the question is called by the chair, and then all of a sudden, kind of, you all go away, and then there's like a survey says moment, right? When all of a sudden, boom, 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 and you see all the different votes. So I guess what I was trying to think about is, could, it, could there be a moment where you're announcing, I, board member Greer, I'm going to oppose this particular issue, and I'm not going to vote in favor of it because A, B, and C. If you're using the electronic system, you probably don't have that natural moment. So to me, during the discussion, you know, you're sharing, this is how I'm going to vote on right here. I, I think, Dr. Bo, ultimately, we're trying to focus on substantial compliance here. And so as long as that, that comment being made, you know, contemporaneously, right at the moment where the vote's happening, I feel a little less nervous about it. If people are, are projecting and throwing out there in the public when they're going to, how they're going to vote on something, then I start getting a little nervous. Please. I just wanted to go back to what um, board member Cruz Gonzalez was talking about when we're having a discussion, either, you know, how, why we're voting yes or no. Um, it's true. Sometimes, you know, we just go round and round in a circle, you know, talking about the same thing. So is there any like rule where there's a time limit or, you, you know what I mean? Because you're just, you know, speaking. Or, or, you know, someone's talking about the same thing, but we get the point. Like you said, either you stress your point, why or why not? And there's your answer. You, you know, and, uh, and I hope I'm explaining that right. But. You are. And I think the first question I hear is, are there time limitations on individual board yeah. members? Yes. And in my mind, no, there's not. I mean, a board member could, you know, have the floor. If the board member is recognized by the chair, the board member could speak. Now, is that an efficient way to do business? Probably not. Um, well. Probably, definitely not, right? But ultimately, in my experience, each board member wants the opportunity to address the topic. It doesn't mean that they're going to. And so that's the, the slippery slope where we start, if you start curtailing the ability of board members to participate in the discussion, then it's going to create some feelings that, hey, my point of view is being disregarded. And I think this goes back to board member Greer's point about kind of adhering to Robert's rules, doing the best we can, and then having some some common ground on intent. And I think that that's 100% true. You need to have that trust. But, but I also, members. I hear from communities sometimes, like, you know, I'm kind of confused because you, know, you guys are like going everywhere. You know, I, I, we're focusing on one thing and then all of a sudden it, the, discuss, the discussion gets lost in, in, in the conversation. And, and I've heard that from community members. I, I expect you, you have. And I, what I also know about elected officials is that they want to explain to their constituents directly in their own voice why they're voting for a particular issue. And, and they're bound you know, by the bylaws to explain why they're not voting for something. So um, if you're looking for limitations on board members speaking, I'm well, probably not the person. No, no, yeah. no what I mean by I mean, not, I understand your point, but I'm just saying that you, um, you stress your points, you know, one, two, three, four, five, or, or whatever. And then, we get it, you know, kind of a thing. You know, instead of just going around talking about the same thing, I, I, I don't know, you know, I just kept to hear that from the community, so I just wanted to stress. Well, I, I appreciate that, and, and I, I tend to agree with you. I go to a lot of meetings, and so um, I agree with you. I'll just leave it at that. Please, Dr. I mean, it's something that I've been thinking about, too, about how to um, have a robust dis discussion while also being lean with time and um have you had any experience with other governing boards where maybe there are you know two rounds right so you go board member a b c right and another round and if they're really and then we have to really think about if i don't have anything new to say then then i'm then i pass and not feel compelled to reiterate i mean d do any of your boards or clients kind of adopt that procedure to help them make sure that we're going around so that every board member has the opportunity to speak? I haven't seen anything adopted formally. And what I could see happening in practice is as, a, as an informal rule, we, get, we each get one shot. But what almost always happens is somebody remembers something and they're, you're on the spot. You are all on the spot in the moment. The public is here. And sometimes people are going to forget that main core critical point. But, but to your question, 
I have not seen boards adopt kind of a, you get two rounds only. But, but I do respect our board president because she'll say at the end, does anyone have any more questions? So, so she is giving us the opportunity if we do, or uh, we'll say no, and, <clears throat> but she does give us that opportunity. Okay. And, and, and I actually had a question. So um, since we're, we're on this, for example, you said the two rounds, right? So say, for example, a board member had five, six questions. Again, um, I mean, these are the questions that this board member feels that they need to ask at that particular time. Therefore, you know, whoever's chair will will give this individual the time um, to, to go ahead and ask those questions, correct? Yes. I mean, and we talked about this earlier. The decorum is that the chair needs to recognize whoever's speaking. And I'll, I'll put myself in that point of view that I'm board member of Vegas and I want to ask another question. And so I'm kind of like, recognize me over here. And my question is, you know, what time does McDonald's close? Because I'm, and I don't want to be here anymore. And if those are my contributions over time, I, I suspect that, you know, board members may be less likely to recognize me. But again, that is a really slippery slope, right? Because ultimately you're here and you have to work together with trust. And there has to be stability. And so if board members are having relevant questions to an issue that hasn't been voted on, you want that question to be answered before the vote happens. I mean, that's the whole point. So, I mean, I, I guess just to clarify when I brought this up, in my mind, I wasn't talking about questions to staff, right? My my mind, I was talking about when we deliberate amongst ourselves and are having a discussion about, you know, what how to vote on an item or what how to move forward. That's what I was talking about. Okay. So, again, kind of going through... We have a general sense of decorum. I've seen the decorum happen, and it happened with multiple chairs in the room. And I think the general rule is everybody has an opportunity to speak to an issue, and I've, I've seen that happen. All right, statement of the record. You can request that written or oral statements be included in a minute. Um, I know that Hope is, you know, kind of feverishly working to capture everything that happens in in the meeting minutes. So my my thought is that you probably don't even need to say that. Um, but I do, I do know that it can be a dramatic flourish, right? It can be, you know, can we make sure that this gets in the minute? Um, and so that would kind of just be a point of making sure that a particular statement or something is kind of recorded before the meeting has. Can, can I can you clarify for this? So is this, this is a Brown Act requirement or this is parliamentary proceed? This is Robert's Rules of Board. To me, this is um, Robert's Rule. Because we, so, and I think we haven't, discussed, we haven't discussed it as a board, but I think, when we went to an online system and started recording, we, as the board, I think, and half of you weren't even here, right? we made a decision that we were going to move to action minute, which just record the action and summary minute. Um, and that if somebody wanted to have a full, see the full transcript, they could go watch the video um, because, because it is, that is available. So our practice has been not to, if somebody, rec like, and it happens in public comics, sometimes somebody brings their comments and say, I request this gets put in the record, right? I think our practice has been not to do that because that's not, we made it clear that's not what the minutes are. Um, but so how does that fit within what you're putting here? Well, and, and let me let me give an example. And it may be that it, it a, a difference without a distinction here. It may be that I'm board member of Viegas and it's being recorded for YouTube. And I say, and, and you know, get this in the minute. I, I'm going to say X, Y, and Z. Technically, my statement is recorded in the minute. It's recorded on the live. Now, it may not be in the action summary that you mentioned, but it is being captured and being recorded. So to, to that point, I would say I am on the, on the YouTube. I have been captured. My statement is there. To, to your point, it may be that statements of the record are irrelevant for the way the board does business in Azusa. You don't necessarily need that. And this goes back to the question of, you know, when do we cut off comments and things among board members? The reality is the board members want to make those mini statements of the record on particular issues. So you probably don't need the pomp and circumstance saying statement for the record. And how about, well, one of the things that um, uh, board member Krizenzel had mentioned where we have a public comment, um, right? And we have uh, somebody from the community come and say, I, I would like this recorded in the minute. So what you're saying is, is that it will not be recorded in the minute uh, 
physically that they will have, they can go to, but if we ask, right, the, the, the uh, member from the public asked, I want these recorded I because I need those minutes for X, Y, I don't know, for whatever reason, they wanted them because they, can we do that? Yeah, and it sounds like there may be a slight difference in what your practice is. So let me let me just ask the question. Have you ever taken a member's, has a member of the public ever asked you, I'd like my comments to be recorded in the record? Yes. Did that happen? Okay. And how was that handled? Was it just, they were recorded via YouTube? Nothing special was done? Uh, <clears throat> currently, our practice doesn't match our our policies. Right. Um, our policies are exactly what uh, Board Member Cruz Gonzalez said. Um, and uh, we just stumbled upon this uh, not too long ago uh, as we were updating policies. Uh, we were uh, just doing what the practice was uh, prior to us um, coming here. And the practice right now is full transcript of minutes. But that is not our policy. That is not what's written in our in our board policy. Our board policy matches up exactly to what board member Cruz Gonzalez says. And and actually that that was partly my point earlier. So the practice is that Hope's going to try to get as much of everything that's happening in real time. So if that member of the public makes that statement, it is automatically in the minute. It's in it's on the record, if you will. And and I'll add another layer to that. It's also recorded, right, via YouTube. So there's multiple records of this person making this comment. But that might be something over time that you all look at in other governor's trainings and see if this is consistent with what the board wants to do. Okay. Calling for the question. Again, um, I only have about 45 more slides. So I'll let you by here. Really only about four or five. So this results in the end of the board discussion puts the matter to vote. We, we can call it, call the question. We can just say, can we have a vote? It's not critical to kind of get bogged down in what terminology is. I've seen you all do this um, and it works. It's, it said must be second, just to be clear. It says must be seconded. Does that mean that? And once it's seconded, then it moves to the, to the vote or it needs to be seconded. And then now there's a vote on whether the question is called. Um, it must be seconded and then you're going to move towards the vote. Of the main motion. Of, of whatever motion is being considered right then. Are you sure? You have to vote on a call. If you, you have to vote on that. And call, vote on calling for the question or vote on the main motion? Yeah, you can't just get a motion and second to call for the question. And then, have, you have, then the vote is on the call for the question. Do you guys currently vote on having a vote? No. And so, I, I mean, normally what we do is just by consensus, then the chair would be like, okay, let's vote. Right. right? Right. Um, but technically, with parliamentary procedure, there would be a vote on it. Yeah, and it's kind of like um, adjourning, you know, that there has to be a, a motion a second before you're adjourning because some people may want to adjourn and other people may not. What it sounds like is the practice here is if there's a consensus, if every board member has had an opportunity to speak, there's no more comments, can we proceed to the vote? Yes, we can. That that's your practice, right? Right, and usually it's not somebody saying, "I call for the question." It's usually like, "I think we need to vote now." Like one of us says, "It's not very formal." Yeah, and and it sounds like there are, there are some differences between your practice and what your exhibit on Robert Rules say and what the actual Robert Rules say. That's not uncommon. You guys never formally adopted Robert Rules, but I do know that there are going to be some some differences in the way that these things are handled. Right. I, I think uh, what we practice is the chair, whoever. What I've seen as well is they'll ask again if there's any more discussion and the chair will call uh, for the vote. Yeah, I'm kind of like a some closing comment. Right. You know, like a little bit of closure to the process. All right. Any more comments? Okay. Hearing none. Um, can we have a vote? And then if board member Gurr says, no, 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 I'm actually, you know what? I do have another comment. Then at that point, there's going to be another comment and that could trigger more rounds of comments. All right, quorum. I think you are all familiar with quorum and just having kind of over 50% of total board members. You have a five person board. So that would be three people for quorum. Um, and you have to recess unless you have quorum. You can't really proceed with the actual meeting unless you have quorum. And if somebody's abstaining, that still counts for purposes of quorum. Um, now, again, I think this goes to your point, board member Cruz Gonzalez. There are going to, there's going to be things in these slides that which aren't exactly, you know, apples to apples with the practice that you have, right? And so I think, for example, the roll call by the president 
sounds like the roll call all goes through the electronic system. So you, you don't hear that kind of verbal roll call of how each person does it. Or do you guys announce it verbally? I think it just also it pops up. Or is there also a verbal? Um, after, after. After. So whatever the result is, then whoever is the chair will go ahead and, you know, five zero four one three two. Vote passes, vote does not pass, or however, and uh, there is right after. And is it the chair that announces that? Or, or Hope, do you say the motion has passed unanimous chair? Okay. Yeah, and I think the what I've also noticed in watching the meetings via Zoom is that it's also shown on the screen. You clearly get to see how each board member voted, and there was a clear record of how each board member voted in the minutes. Those are the core pieces that we need to satisfy for the Brown Act. Um, Carlos, can you speak to any differences or what you've seen in terms of voting simultaneously or electronically and simultaneously versus a roll call vote? Yes, no, yes, no. Board member uh, Rodriguez Pina is now the tiebreaker. Well, the, the one thing I, I noticed right away was last time when we had multiple votes, the system presented kind of a little bit of a limitation. So I, I remember at the moment I was thinking, well, if you guys had an opportunity to kind of just go through the votes and record them, then that may not have come up. But I, I don't want to throw out a perfectly good system just because, you know, we had a double vote. Um, I, and I also understand your comment to be a little bit like, if you do a verbal vote and we're going through and we've hit the first four board members and you got a tie two two, that really puts a lot of pressure or power in that last board member to decide how it's going to go either way. Um, I think the short answer is there's not there's not necessarily a wrong way to do it. it sounds like you all have a system of voting, and um, and again this is a this is another example where Robert Jules may say roll call is done by the chair. You all have an electronic system. There's nothing wrong with your system. Um, was there a, a, another point, Dr. Bo, that I'm not getting at? Well, I guess maybe I'm asking my veteran colleagues for their perspective on either at times when electronic school board wasn't working or you chose to do a roll call vote and then the last vote was by the president, right? Because I could, one could think that those outcomes could be different, right? Two yeses, two noes, and then the tie-breaking vote is with the board president. And so I'm, I'm looking for, have there been instances in the past where it's been um, an important vote and it rolled out that way instead of voting simultaneously? I, I have not. I have not seen it even when I've watched the meetings for the last 20. All right, so I'll, I'll throw a different hard question. And it may be, I don't know, maybe that's something you guys can all expand on in a governance meeting um, to kind of talk about how that, how that all works and maybe what was in place before that came about. But I, I did want to throw one more kind of difficult situation at you. And this is once you've called for the vote, at that point, when you're watching online, you know, you're all of a sudden, the next thing you're going to see is all the votes broadcast. So if that happens and you fall for the vote, okay, can we all vote? People are in the process of voting. Then at that point, it is too late to kind of go back and say, wait, 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 can we open the discussion? Um, I think I want to move to amend or do something. In my mind, you're all baked in. Like the voting is happening at the moment. And that comes a little bit from the exhibit, a little bit from Robert Schulz that once you've called for the question, once you've called for the vote, no other business uh, can be conducted until that roll call finishes. I'll ask a, a question. Uh, so that same scenario, already baked in. Uh, it flashes up and I'm like, what? No, no, that's not what I meant to vote. I pushed the wrong button. And, and you don't have to live with that wrong vote forever, right? Because you can't have a vote change before the report out. I think the point I'm making is we can't take a complete detour and say, now we're going to have a more discussion. Then all of a sudden you got three or four board members and their votes are kind of hanging out there in the balance. Other people haven't voted yet. That would be problematic. But if all of a sudden you're looking at it, and I think come up before, you're looking at it and so wait, it hit the wrong button. Then you want to 
change that before the report out means. And, and what I, when I'm talking about the report out here, what I'm really focused on is before it's recorded in the final minute. And so that might, that might throw us for a loop where the electronic system is saying one thing and we have to make a correction um, in the actual minute. And I don't know if the system allows you to do that. So, so maybe my mind goes to worst case scenario with that, but um, you're not saying I look at the vote and it was a no. I meant to say yes. So I wait. And at the end of the meeting, I go and say, hey, Hope, it wasn't a no, it was a yes. And now she changed. You're saying in real time, communicate the error so that it's, so that it's on, the, on the record in the meeting. And even if the electronic system records it inaccurately, just in, in, it's most important that it's, that it's accurately re represented in the minute. Absolutely. In real time. And I, I like the idea of looking up and confirming that's the way you voted. Because if you approach Hope later, it would be, I'll just say problematic, right? And, and you're probably going to hear it from your other board members. Um, the public needs to have trust in the system. And so if the public is sitting there listening to it, and that's another whole issue, right? They think it was a 3-2 in favor of the contract for the sidewalk cleaning. All of a sudden, they, they wake up the next day and they see it's actually 3-2 opposed. Somebody switched the vote later. That's beyond problematic. And notice it says votes may be changed before the final report out. In my mind, that means the announcement of what the votes were. And so I, I would ask all the board members to be vigilant, take a look at what's happening with your with your vote, make sure it's an accurate vote. And if it's not, you know, we, we yell over to Hope and say, please, I think I hit the wrong button. Okay. That's it. Unless there's more questions, I was going to get into hypotheticals, but it seems like we, we did that on our own. But we are about two hours in. Please. So this is. It's a question, but it's, it's, um, I imagine I know what your answer would be, Carlos. And so maybe it's more, it, it could be just uh, getting on the same page with, with colleagues here. So as, as things pertain to the consent calendar, it would seem to me that following Robert's rules of order for the consent calendar would unnecessarily complicate. Because if, if, we, if, if someone makes, if there needs to be a motion before, and so someone moves to approve the consent calendar, and then someone says, I substitute motion to approve the consent calendar except for 10.1. Someone says, I substitute for 10.2 as well. So what, So it would seem to me that, you know, this is a, it's a parliamentary Robert's Rules of Order thing uh, versus a, a Brown Act thing. What, what is the most appropriate way, you, uh, what is the most appropriate way to go about consent calendar items so that we are following the, you know, a, a procedure? Is it most appropriate to just say who wants to pull what and people indicate out loud the items that they, if any, that they are intending to pull? Uh, and, and then there's a motion based off of, you know, excluding those items that have been communicated. What, what, what seems to make the most sense? And I think the question was originally for the board, but if the, the board members don't have a, a suggestion, I don't have a problem with the way you're doing it right now. And the way, it, the way I've seen it roll out is, calendar. There is a motion to approve the consent calendar as written. There's a second. There's discussion. And that, at that point, board member Vegas could say, I'm not comfortable with that agreement 9.3 with other public pulled out. Once it's pulled out, I've seen almost seamlessly, it drops down to the individual consideration from the consent calendar. The way, the way I saw it happen, board member Greer, I was, I was pleasantly surprised that it was that smooth. And so my thought is, if it's not broke, don't fix it. And, and yes, and, and our board president does ask prior, does anyone have an item to be pulled? And then it is pulled and the number has changed, you know, and then we vote on this portion and then we discuss why. So I think that procedure works pretty well. Um, and the board president does walk us through it. So we vote for the ones that have been pulled. I, I agree. So, it's just extreme clear. Sorry. So is it most appropriate to stay? We're on a consent calendar, you know, we're on 10.0 consent calendar. Are there any items to pull as the, on the front end? Or is it most appropriate to say 10.1, you know, consent calendar, someone makes the most, it's moved, then it's seconded, and then in the discussion, ask for items to be pulled? Uh, if I was being a Robert's Rule stickler, I might say make that motion, make that second, have the discussion, then pull the items out. But I think in practice, 
I think if you audit board meetings, you're probably going to see it done both ways. Sure. And I don't see any problem with a with a board chair saying any items to be pulled and short circuiting that process. Sure. The, the most critical part for me is, does it drop down to the other consideration? Is there a tracking of that motion? Is our agenda clean? That's probably my number one concern. Mm -hmm. And so say, for example, we have um, all five board members pulling five different things, right? And it becomes uh, two different things. And it becomes like, we just pull everything apart. How does, so so our, our secretary then moves them down to 11.1, 11.2, 11.3, 11.4, and so forth and so forth, right? So we're voting on them separately, having different discussions. Right. And so one of the things that um, do we vote annually? Is, is the system allows? This changes the numbers up on the screen and then we vote on the minister, shall we? And does that give, and I, actually I haven't asked, does that give you plenty of time if we were to, let's just say, hypothetically speaking, we all are pulling that consent calendar apart? Sometimes it does. Sometimes you move a little quickly. I have to switch screens. It does move quickly if if I a little bit of time, especially if it's a few. I switch screens. I have to hear the numbers. I want to move 10.3, 10.4, go all the way down to 10.9 so I can hear all three of them. If I click them, I can go up, move them in one motion, and that's how they move so fast. But it's more about making sure I can hear what you're saying. So I click the right one, and then it moves quick. Okay, thank you for that. Um, <clears throat> if, if there are no more questions about the quote unquote training, uh, tonight <clears throat> we were also going to, the board was wanted to discuss, uh, and, uh, board member Greer kind of opened it up a little bit, uh, discuss, um, having, uh, our attorney at regular meetings during open session. Uh, that was a request that, that tonight this conversation continue, that it was not an action item, it was just a conversation. Uh, and I guess I'll, I'll just lead, um, and I'm viewing this as all part of your board governance workshop because you're looking at the best way to govern govern the board. Um, and so, and, and to your point, that there won't be any particular action taken here. But I know that there was a question, I think, from either board member Rodriguez Pena or another board member about whether or not we could establish some other kind of lower rate for just the Robert Schools portion. And so I've, I've looked into that and um, I commit to having the paralegal rate to have counsel here, um, which would be $230 per hour, um, or we can work on different flat rate based on the 230 So whatever the board needs for us to do, we're, we're amenable to doing. I, I would have um, liked to, to have that in front of me. Uh, we had it in our packet regarding the hours, you know, we had it all broken down. If, I would like to have known prior that we were going to discuss it, so I could have had that in front of me. I apologize. You know, like it's like if you say four hours, you get so, it's so much. If it's three hours, it's so much. That one that yeah, like it was a, right. Remember that one? Yep. Um, I, I personally would like to have, have had that in front of me. I didn't know that we were going to discuss it right now today. Yeah, and I apologize. We'll I should have agendized. Would should it not have been agendized before we? It's in the um, it's in the rationale um, that um, that we'll discuss having an attorney at every board meeting during open session. Um, so it is part of the rationale. But apologize for not. But but it's not written. Should have been posted. It is. If you go to the if you go to the actual item four point one. Right now we're just looking at the at the cover sheet. Oh, oh I see what you're saying. Yeah. Okay. So I'll, I'll, I'll just add my thoughts um, from the beginning. I, I, I think this conversation even, even further put me in the, in the, the camp of, of my thoughts around just the, the 
it, you know, how, how worth it, it might be to have legal counsel present when what we are, the, the, challenge, the challenges that we're having or that we have from time to time is around parliamentary Robert's Rules of Order things. And, and I think that we're able to get by. And even to like, the example that I said earlier, even when there's legal counsel present, there's still um, hiccuping and dancing around to, 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 you know, get back on the right, right, on the right place. And again, I, I think that last time maybe even took more time trying to get there than, than us um, recognizing that maybe something is slightly out, but we can, but it's not, a, it's not a violation. It's not invalidating the votes that are taking place, but maybe we forgot, you know, we didn't vote on the substitute motion. We just voted on the original motion, but technically we should have taken a moment to vote on the, those, those, those are, those are process things that, that seem, that, that don't seem as significant if we're, when we're looking at the, the amounts of monies that we're going to pay just to, to ensure that we're being sticklers on like process rule. So, so I think it does make sense as, as we kind of talk when we know that there are um, highly contentious items or, or potentially controversial or, or you know, how, and, and what, whatever we want to do, maybe if we just give discretion to the, to the, uh, board president to, to, and, and to, to look at that and make the final say when, when we're, we're looking at those things and, 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 and trust that they're seeing what those things are and, and inviting legal counsel here for, for those. But a, apart from that, I, I, I would say that that's, a, um, that's, that's quite a bit of, that has a potential to be quite, quite a bit of money just to make sure we're following processes that are relatively, that have the potential to be relatively insignificant. And I may say that I, I, I agree with Board Member Greer. You know, what, when it's necessary and we do need him here, yes, we should call him. Um, I don't feel like every single meeting, since you you know you have observed our meetings, you even mentioned that, you know, we're doing okay. I mean, you you observed. Um, and, 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 and same thing as like last time, you said, you know, we took more time trying to break down what we were trying to figure out because you were here, you know, helping us through. So just, it did take longer then if we just would have fit it on our own, just ask. But yeah, I, I agree. Um, so I agree, I agree with Adrian. I mean, and I can think of like two upcoming meetings where it would be important to have legal yeah. counsel, right? When we talk about, when we actually have maps to talk about redistricting, and when we talk about school closure, like the actual action items, I think those make sense, but not necessarily, but not every day-to-day -day meeting. And I also agree. Uh, and to add on, um, I think that this session was very valuable. It allowed us some um, deep study to ask very specific questions and hypotheticals and walk through them. And I would be in favor of having um, additional workshops on this, even if it's something like an annual refresher, so that we continue the study. And that's my opinion on it. Thank you so much. Um, the majority has spoken. I, I do agree. And this is uh, why I, I had asked if um, legal counsel could be here till the end of the year, because we are going through the reconfiguration. And thank you guys for your comments. Um, and so given that the majority feels that um, with the reconfiguration and the redistricting, is something major that we are going to be going through in the next several meetings, which are only, um, I believe, three, three meetings left. But then my question would be to, to the board, um, is, is that something that you guys would be okay with for council to be here for the next um, three regular board meetings that we are going to have? I'm sorry, we have one on the 26th. Just for uh, just for clarity, we're um, are, I, I don't know that I I don't know that what I'm I'm so I'm not saying necessarily that we have the legal counsel here for the next X number of meetings. I'm instead saying that when we know that we're voting on items, um, then then we would invite counsel to, to those meetings. So let's suppose at the next meeting we're voting on something. The second meeting we're not voting on on something that we would consider, you know, hot hot topic item. But then the third meeting out, we do. Then we would invite counsel to the first and the third, but not the second. Heard you. Okay. So, um, I, I, what does the rest of the board feel? I agree. Yep. Okay. 
then we'll go ahead and uh, you and I will go ahead and sit down and just map that out. We have just uh, plug plug that in. So thank you guys for 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 your comments. Um, thank you so much for your other comments and and uh, saying that this meeting was very valuable. Um, it it is it is valuable, and I appreciate all of your comments. Um, and thank you for being here. Does anybody have anything else for legal counsel at this time? Thank you, Mr. Carlos Villegas, for coming out. As, uh, as we're moving on on our agenda for tonight, we're moving on to 5.1, and that is our adjournment. So I am asking for a motion to move 5.1. Make motion to approve 5.1. Second. We have a first by board member Rodriguez Pena. We have a second by board member Greer. We are adjourned. Good night, everyone. Have a great night. We'll see you guys next week.